Hi there, this is James Swanick, and you're listening to the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast, where you learn how to take back control over alcohol and live a life of health, wealth, love, and happiness. I'm James Swanick. Welcome to the show. In January 2023, we held our annual Alcohol Free Lifestyle Retreat. We did it in Medellin, Colombia. And we had an event in a hotel in a suburb of Medellin, Colombia called El Poblado. And we had 30 of our Project 90 and Beyond 90 clients fly down to Medellin. And we spent four days, four nights together. Uh, On the first day, we did some sightseeing. On the second day, we went to a hotel and we had a series of speakers and we did some exercises and workshops. And then we went out and did some more sightseeing. We had a wonderful time, all alcohol free. I'm about to play for you a talk that I gave called 21 Ways to the Good Life. And these are just 21 habits that I have that help me create the good life. Uh, You'll hear me in just a moment welcome our clients back from a lunch break. Um, I just do a little bit of housekeeping. You can hear me um, talking through that. You can hear some of the clients talking in the background. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of a feel of what it's like to actually be at our alcohol-free lifestyle uh, annual event. There's another one coming up in January. Uh, And usually we do these internationally. We might be doing Mexico in 2024, or we might be doing Sedona, Arizona. We haven't decided yet. But in any case, here are 21 ways to the good life. These are my good life habits. And these are some of the habits that we invite our Project 90 and Beyond 90 clients. Just to clarify, Project 90 is our 90 day stop drinking program for high achievers who want to rewire their mindset around alcohol. And then once Project 90 clients graduate, they then um, have the opportunity to move into what's called Beyond 90. And Beyond 90 is an additional nine months of personal development coaching where we have New York Times bestselling authors come in and coach them. We do business masterminds. We have Olympic medalists come in and coach on peak performance. We've had uh, the world's top relationship coach, uh, John Gray, who wrote the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. We've had one of the world's top sleep doctors, Dr. Michael Bruce, come in and speak to our Beyond 90 clients. So when you hear me reference Project 90, Beyond 90, that's Um, what I'm talking about. But anyway, enough preamble from me. Let's roll the tape. This is me speaking in Medellin, Colombia at Alcohol Free Lifestyle Live in January 2023. All right, so I'm going to do this in 21 minutes. 21 ways to the good life in 21 minutes, and then we'll do nine minutes of Q&A. So it's going to be super fast. You guys ready? Yes. All right. Number one's already on the board. Daily 20, okay? So I almost always, sometimes I don't, but almost always I write down 20 things that I'm grateful for each and every day. And I do it in the morning, first thing in the morning when I do it. Uh, I don't want to get too graphic, but on occasion, instead of taking my phone to the bathroom, I may take a notepad and a pen and I might do my 20 things that I'm grateful for while I'm in the bathroom. Who here wants to admit to taking their phone to the toilet? Ah, oh, thank you. We're in good company here. Amazing. So what you could do instead is take a notepad and a pen, and instead of aimlessly, or mindlessly scrolling on your phone, you could take this and quote unquote force yourself to write down 20 things you're grateful for. Now, why not just three? Because there's lots of books out there on mindfulness and happiness, and it's feel good. You know, you write down three things. Well, I like to activate what's called the reticular activating system, otherwise known as the RAS. And this is a bundle of nerves in your brain that says that when you are focused on something, your mind tends to see more of that very thing. So if I am, quote unquote, forcing myself to be grateful in the morning, and I'm trying to find evidence of things to be grateful for, and I'm thinking, well, this is hard. I did 20 yesterday. I've got to come up with 20 new things today. Then I'm activating that bundle of nerves in my brain. So then for the remainder of the day, I just tend to see evidence that there's things to be grateful for. And that reduces stress, reduces anxiety, the frequency and the ferocity. And then my life just seems to be a lot more pleasant. I'm not saying I'm skipping down the street every day singing, my oh my, what a wonderful day. But on most days, I'm not walking down the street going, my life sucks, this is horrible. On occasion, I might think that. Juliana's laughing because she's like, that's ridiculous. Of course you do, James. (laughs) On occasion. So the first step is the daily 20. Would you like an oxygen tank water? You good? <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can go over here. Only ever use a portable alarm clock. Does anyone know what I mean by this? Yeah, who wants to have a go at it? Not your phone. Not your phone. Yeah, not your phone. 
put the phone someplace else. Yeah. So this thing, if the alarm goes off on this device in the morning, what do you do? Snooze. Your hand, well, well, snooze is one thing you can do, but what, before you do that, what do you do? You pick it up. You put your hand on your phone. First thing. First thing in the morning. You wake up in the morning and right away you're in reactionary mode. You're picking this thing up and now what do you do? You're scrolling, you're looking, you're doing stuff. Your whole day has just got off to a potentially compromised to start, right? Because now you're in distraction, you're reacting. There's emails and texts, there's Instagram, there's CNN.com, there's FoxNews.com, there's blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And you're already making your mind do a heck of a lot of work before you've even got up to go to the bathroom and do your daily 20. So I have a $5 alarm clock that I bought on Amazon. That is what wakes me up each morning. It's what woke me up this morning. And I set a little rule in my life, which is I'm not allowed to put my hand on my phone until I've completed my daily 20. So this is a way that you can manipulate your environment to get out of bad habits and into good habits. James Clear wrote the book Atomic Habits. Anyone read that book? Yeah, it's read, it's, I think it sold about 12 million copies. But I interviewed him for Project 90 and 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge, and he said, <clears throat> excuse me, the way to have great habits is to increase the steps between you and the bad habits and decrease the steps between you and the good habits. Yeah? So what I'm doing with the portable alarm clock is I'm decreasing the steps between me and my phone. Alarm goes off. Now I've got a rule. 20 things, I write one, two, three, four, like literally go down 20 and then I think, okay, this, 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 this. So the second thing is get yourself a $5 portable alarm clock from Amazon. Be 100% responsible for your life. What does that mean? It means no one's really doing anything bad to you or good to you and you're responsible. You're responsible how you process that occurrence. I'm responsible if I'm feeling anger, like Juliana was talking today about feeling anger and those emotions. I'm responsible for that. Nobody else is responsible for that. My wife or my girlfriend or my husband or my boyfriend or whatever might say something, and then you might sit back and claim, oh, she made me cry. Anyone been watching this Prince Harry book promotion thing that's come out and there's this story that's been going on about how Princess Kate made Meghan Markle cry, and Meghan said, oh, she made me cry. I'm watching that going, no, she didn't. You made yourself cry. <laughs> she didn't make you cry. You chose to cry. Nothing that Princess Kate said to you could have ever have made you cry. She didn't do anything to you. She just did what she did, and you decided to process it in a way that had you cry. So that's Meghan Markle in this example, not being responsible. It's blaming someone else, blaming a circumstance, blaming an occurrence, instead of I'm responsible for how I felt. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Create healthy visual cues and create unhealthy ones. <clears throat> this is to speak to James Clear again in his um, Atomic Habits. So each evening before I go to sleep, I prepare my gym clothes. So I have my shirt, my shorts, my shoes, my socks, my water bottle, my bag, and I put it in strategically between my bed and the bathroom. So when I wake up in the morning and I finally get out of bed, whenever that is, the first thing I see are my gym clothes. So I've hacked the system sufficiently enough that I see the gym clothes, I therefore put the gym clothes on, now the likelihood that I'm actually going to go to the gym is way up here, as opposed to if I didn't prepare my clothes the night before, where I'd wake up and go, oh, what, I've got to find the thing, I'm missing a sock, which is, happens a lot with me, and doing all this kind of, maybe I'm not going to do it. But I've created a visual cue that in the morning I see that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to the gym. Uh, I mostly don't have a full-time place of residence at the moment. I tend to travel around quite a lot. But when I did have a, when I was in a place for a year or so, um, we would have glass mason jars all over the house. When I lived with Juliana, um, there were glass mason jars everywhere. And I would see these glass mason jars and I would go, water. Okay, great. So I'm going to fill up these glass mason jars with water and I'm going to drink copious amounts of water from it. And glass mason jars have a big round kind of mouthpiece to them, don't they? As opposed to a traditional bottle of water like our amazing AFL ones here, which just has a very small amount. So with here, you're just sipping little bits of water, but with a glass mason jar with a huge big round mouthpiece like this, 
you actually end up drinking probably four, five, six times more than you ordinarily would. But, the, but looking at those glass mason jars around the house makes me think, okay, water, drink water. And then I end up drinking more water. Okay, so visual cues. Another great thing to do is buy yourself a bouquet of flowers. Men as well. I know it doesn't seem like a very alpha male thing to do. And I remember I was living in Venice Beach, California, and the markets would open on a Friday, and I would go down to these markets to buy this bouquet of flowers. And I was, every time I was walking back from the Venice Beach markets to my apartment in Venice Beach carrying this bouquet of flowers, I always thought that the people who were driving by probably thought that I'd done something wrong to a girlfriend <laughs> or a wife. So I was kind of very sheepishly carrying these flowers. But then I would get home, and I would put them in this vase, and I would just say to myself, I'm going to replace the water in this vase every single day. First of all, I'm going to cut the stem so they last a little bit longer. And I'm going to nurture and love and support these flowers. And then I would leave my apartment. And then I'd come back. I'd forget the flowers were there. And the first thing I would see when I'd walk in the door were these flowers. I'm like, wow, look at that. The scent and the color and the, the brightness of it all. And it became a metaphor for my own life. And so I'm like, I'm thinking about these flowers. I'm taking care of these flowers. I'm going to take care of my own body. And so a couple of times I'd go to the Air One supermarket near where I lived and I'd be waiting in line and they've got all the candy and the sugars and all that kind of stuff, you know, for that instantaneous buy before you check out. A couple of times I go, ah, and then I go, oh, the flowers. That's right, I'm taking care of myself. I'm going to decline that and I'm just going to make healthy choices. So again, try to manipulate your environment to create healthy visual cues instead of unhealthy ones. Make your bed. Now this seems really simple. Uh, and it is, but there's a great YouTube video, I think it's had something crazy like 40 million views from a former Navy SEAL from the University of Texas, is that right? And he was giving a, um, what, what's it called when people, address. thank you, yes, talking to college students who were leaving college. <clears throat> and he said, here are my rules for life. And number one was, make your bed. And then you could hear all these people go, ha, 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 that's ridiculous. But he just stayed stony faced and he said, when you make your bed in the morning, first thing, you've now completed a task. And now you have that momentum going, and then it's easier to do the next task and easier to do the next thing. Plus, because you see that made bed every time you walk in the room, it's now telling your mind and your nervous system, OK, we've got to, everything's OK. Everything's in order, as opposed to a messy, unmade bed where uh, things are a little bit chaotic, things are a little bit out of control. I manipulate myself by spending a lot of time in hotels where they make my bed for me, which is really, very convenient. But make your bed. Again, it creates a healthy visual cue of order, of health. Yeah? Uh, drink more clean water. None of us drink enough water. Sorry. I'm sure there are many in this room who don't drink enough water. Right, that's a better way of saying it, myself included. But as you'll know from being through alcohol-free alcohol lifestyle, we've got to flush, flush toxins out of the system, right? And so what most of us are waking up in the morning, what's the first thing most of us do? We go and have a coffee. Maybe we have a glass of water. And then the day goes on, maybe we'll have another coffee. Then we have a little bit of water. Oh, look, there's a water bottle over there. I'll, I'll drink this and I'll sip this. And we get to the end of the day and we wonder why we're so tired and fatigued because we're not hydrating ourselves sufficiently enough. I, I say this a lot about alcohol that, just a warning, you do get better looking when you stop drinking alcohol. You get infinitely more better looking when you stop drinking alcohol and drink copious amounts of water because our body's, body's largest organ is our skin. Body's largest organ is the skin. So the more water we drink, the more our body can, or our skin rather, can return to its natural state. Anyone here being complimented by anyone two, three months after they stopped drinking? Yeah? Oh, you look good. Have you lost weight? Oh, there's something, something going. I can see people nodding their head. It's not just because you've stopped putting toxins in. It's also because you've been flushing those toxins out. So drink more water. Uh, get morning sunlight. This is really important to set your internal body clock, which is called your circadian rhythm. Most people in North America today wake up, stay indoors for about 90 minutes or two hours, and then they leave the house. They might get in a car. They might have a commute to work. Maybe they get some sunshine when they're walking from the parking lot of their workplace to their office, and then they're inside all day underneath bright fluorescent lights. Yeah? But this, the body wants 
to get morning sunlight. When the sunlight hits the skin, it tells our internal body clock, okay, this is daytime, start to flood the body with some short-term cortisol, the wake-up hormones, get moving, get cracking, and then a timer is put on in your body, which is like, oh, in 16 hours from now, now that I know that I'm awake because the sunlight's hitting my face and my hand, I'm gonna start turning on the melatonin faucet. And the body just naturally then starts to release melatonin. However, if you wake up in most American households, you'll stay indoors, drink your coffee, won't drink enough water, and maybe you'll get your first bit of natural sunlight a couple of hours into the day. Now, if it's a freezing cold North American winter, you don't have to go outside. Just standing by a window with the sunlight coming, on, coming through can be enough. You can also get these um, Panasonic uh, or um, Philips uh, 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 alarm lights, where, this, where the light will wake you up gradually from, say, like 5.30, 5.45, 6 o'clock to mimic the sun. And by the time you kind of it's blasting you, that's when you start to wake up. So you've then attracted or you've, you've manipulated the sun's rays and got some light in the morning. Now, it's nowhere near as effective as natural sunlight, but it's an okay alternative, especially if you're in the winter and you wake up after the, the sun actually comes up. First thing in the morning, grab morning sunlight. I saw a few people here deliberately and intentionally going outside at lunchtime to go and have their lunch in the sun, right? Who did that? Who went out here? Yeah, why did you guys do that? It was freezing in here, besides that. Yeah. Kevin? It feels good. Exactly. We, we've got to love the sun. We've got to embrace it, worship it. First thing in the morning. Block artificial nighttime light. This is a mini sun and we're staring into it at nighttime. And most of us in the room are not blocking that artificial light with a pair of Swanee's blue light blocking glasses. <laughs> I didn't even have to pay for that infomercial, that was good. <clears throat> How many people here are staring into their phone without blocking artificial light at night and they're doing it in the last hour and a half before they go to sleep? Show of hands. Have a look around the room and look. This is not to shame anyone, right? But just look at that. You guys, I promise you, you are destroying your sleep. You're compromising your sleep quality. You're staring into a mini sun at a time when your body wants to release melatonin. Victoria here, another uh, advertisement. Everyone have a look around here. Victoria's got her very fashionable Swannies blue light blocking glasses. There you go, stylish. <laughs> Block as much artificial light as you can. You know what the most effective method is for uh, getting a great night's sleep? Live in the dark and live by candlelight. I'm serious. No one's going to do that, right? No one's going to do that in 2023. The world's progressed too much. Some might say regressed too much. But the most effective way that you can improve your sleep is to live your life by candlelight and not be exposed to artificial light. Because fire and flame does not suppress melatonin production. Now, knowing that no one's going to do that, what is the next best thing we can do? Block as much of that artificial light at night by wearing protective eyewear. Okay? Stay at the click lack where there's no Well, stay at the click lack where there's no Even in the hallway. So, this is how I do it. I mean, I. Everyone's got their own dietary preferences, right? I like to eat 80% of the time paleo style. Paleo essentially just means lean meats, fish, uh, vegetables, uh, salads, uh, and that's pretty much it. Some good fats like uh, grass-fed fat, avocado, nuts. If you guys haven't heard of paleo style, just in invite you to Google it. But essentially, whether you're for this or you're a vegetarian or you're a vegan, What's great about this is that there's no processed foods. Doesn't mean I don't eat processed foods. I mean, sometimes I do, but 80% of the time, I'm eating this with a piece of steak, um, um, wild caught salmon, not the farm raised salmon. I'll tell you how you can tell the difference. You go to a supermarket, if it's farm raised salmon, it'll be pink, dull pink. If it's caught in the ocean, it's like orange and bright. Farm-raised salmon is nasty. This, um, and it's not nasty, but it just has minimal nutritional benefits. Whereas wild-caught salmon, 
amazing. Same with meat and steak as well. Not all steak is created equally. Uh, Grass-fed steak is infinitely better than grain-fed steak. Uh, I, if you guys are steak eaters, eat lots of steak here in Colombia, it's all grass-fed. As opposed to the US where probably it's 80, 90% is grain-fed, and then you have to pay a real premium to get grass-fed steak in the US. This is an obvious one, right? Live alcohol free. Does anyone need any persuading on this, this topic? Felix! Felix is persuading. We were doing a Marco Polo for the groups the other night and he was hiding his Corona underneath the table. And I went, Felix, what are you drinking? Everyone's like, I'm drinking this beautiful soda water. I'm drinking this like fruit juice. But what are you drinking? He's like, oh, nothing. And he like sheepishly brings out and we shamed him publicly. Yeah. Live an alcohol-free lifestyle. Everyone here has experienced the benefits of it. Yes? Yes. yes. Yeah? I don't think I need to go into this. I don't think, I'll, I'll just skip over this one. It's pretty obvious. Uh, finish showers with cold water. Now, if you're really brave, and I was for a time uh, before I kind of retreated a little bit, you can just start with a cold shower and finish with a cold shower. There's so much science now that shows that cold water therapy is so good for reducing stress and anxiety. You see all these people, these influencers doing cold plunges and ice plunges and ice baths and things like that. I get that, Christina, it's freezing cold in New York City yes. in uh, December and January. I get that. It is an experience to try to take a cold shower in New York. Yeah. And, well, actually, any time you're in very cold water, especially this time. Well, here's the thing. Let's just say that someone had a five-minute shower. You could go four minutes, hot shower, and then the last minute, you could go cold for five seconds, then go back to hot, then go cold for five seconds and back to hot, and just do that a few times, and then absolutely finish on cold. Don't finish back on hot. And that is enough to really awaken the, neuro, the uh, nervous system, reduce stress and anxiety. And if you can handle it, Five minutes of cold water therapy in a Manhattan winter in January. I've done cold showers and like, you know, it, it really is great. And, the, and there's a difference between like the cold water here in Miami or in Texas or whatever in New York City cold water. Like it actually feels better in New York because you get that real endorphin. Yes. You know, like, but it's not super cold water, but it's kind of like, eh. Yes. When you get the really cold water, it's the endorphin rush. So be intentional about committing at least one act of kindness a day. I realize I've got two intentionals in there. That's poor grammar. <laughs> my mother would disown me. She was an English teacher, and she's always pulling me up on my grammar on my social media posts. <laughs> uh, commit at least one intentional act of kindness a day. Now, I don't always do this, but on those days that I do it, man, I feel so good. I went to the uh, laundromat here a couple of weeks ago and I went in, it was on Christmas Eve, so it was December 24th, and I went in, there was a Venezuelan woman working there at Stinky's Laundry, which is down the road here, and, uh, which is a cool name for a laundromat. And she was so flustered, she was so overwhelmed because the store was going to close at five o'clock uh, and she had all these orders that were in and she said that she couldn't do mine and I'm like, I really wanted to do mine. And she agreed to do mine. And then I said, are you okay? You seem a little bit kind of flustered. She goes, oh, yeah, I'm so overwhelmed. I, did, I don't even have any food. I'm like so hungry, but I just got all this stuff. And I said, okay, I'm going to go out and get you lunch. And so I went across the road and I went to the chicken shop. I got a half chicken, some potatoes, some, some whatever it was. And I came back, bottle of water, and I gave it to her. And she said, oh, thank you so much. And I walked away and I went, man, I feel really good about that. It's hard to say it was a selfless act because it made me feel good. Right? And now I'm sharing it with you, so now I'm kind of inviting your praise. Wow, what an amazing person James is. But who cares? Because in the moment, I was like, wow, that's, a really, that's an act of kindness. And she so appreciated it, and she was really flustered. I mean, imagine just intentionally going out and going, I'm going to make someone's day today. Just a random act of kindness. Uh, binaural beats for deep focus. So we're all distracted. We're all looking at our phones. Uh, me especially. I go from email to text to WhatsApp to a Slack group to Google to Googling about my favorite football team, Tottenham Hotspur, to looking at Australian news stories, to looking at Bon Jovi news stories, my favorite rock band, to coming back and then seeing funny little dog pictures and stuff on Instagram, to sending Instagram. I mean, it's all over the place. 
But when I really want to do deep work and get into what they call flow, I turn all of that off and I go onto YouTube and I type in binaural beats and I just hit play and there's like five hours of binaural beats. And there's some combination between the beta waves and the theta waves that puts your brain into a deep, deeply focused state. And I can often get more work done in one hour than I could in a, in a week. And I'm not even exaggerating, because a week I might do a little bit here, a little bit there, be distracted, I'm kind of like, uh, uh, uh. But if I just go binaural beats, 20 minutes in, it does take about 15 or 20 minutes to kick in, but when it does, the quality of my work is just outstanding. Always be testing. I think this was going to be always be, what was the word? Closing. 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 There we go. So I've changed it. Famous movie, Alec Baldwin, always be closing. I've changed it to always be testing. What that means is test new things, experiment. Think of yourself as a mad scientist. A few months ago, I'm like, oh, where should we do this conference? Shall we do it in Costa Rica? Should we do it in Miami? I was like, oh, could we do it in Colombia? I'm like, oh, I don't know about Colombia. People are really going to want to come to Colombia. People are going to get on a plane and they're going to fly. And so it was like, let's run a test. So we went on some P90 group calls and we said, hey, here are the options, Miami, Denver, Costa Rica, Mexico, or Colombia. And then people started going, Colombia, Colombia, Colombia. I'm like, okay, that was a good test. Let's do it in Colombia. And then we decided we're going to do it in Colombia, but still we're testing, right? Because we don't know how you guys feel about this yet. We didn't know how many people were going to come, how many people were like, I'm not going there. How many people were going to pull out? But we just like, looked at it as big testing. Let's run it as an experiment. We're running a scientific study at the moment with the University of Washington. It begins February the 1st. We're trying to get 140 people to go through a stop drinking process for 90 days, similar to Project 90. Six months ago, we started talking about this. We're like, should we do this? Should we not do it? There's going to be a lot of extra work. Well, let's just test it, shall we? All right, let's do it. So now we're testing it. So far, we've got 85 out of 140 people enrolled with a week and a half to go. We'll get there. Don't know how we're going to get there, but we'll get there. But that, was, that started as a test. So caught up in our own brain. And we're like, should I do it? Should I not do it? To speak to Kevin's point earlier today, like decision fatigue. Should I not? Should I? Just run a small, minimal test, get you into momentum, and then you see what is revealed. Done a Harvard study. I think it went over 40 or 50 years. And what they found was that community and relationships are the key to long-term happiness. Or so is the single biggest, not the single biggest, sorry, the, the biggest factor in determining someone's fulfillment of life. The quality of your relationships, friendships, family, community. We're all in a community in this room right now, right? Everyone's feeling good, like-minded people, we're supporting each other. If we go through life being friends and, and nurturing our friendships rather than being lone wolves, according to at least this 40-year study from Harvard University, the quality of our life will be far superior. Progress equals happiness. A lot of times we're comparing ourselves to others. I am guilty of it. Compare myself to where I think I should be. Anyone do that? Anyone compare yourself to where you should be? Those shoulds will kill us. Kill our happiness anyway, right? Progress equals happiness. When you look at where you've come from and you focus on that, endorphins are released, serotonin is released. All of a sudden we start to feel grateful. Wow, I was way back here, now look where I am. Isn't that incredible? Instead of focusing from, oh, I should be here. So keep reminding yourself of the progress you have made, because progress equals happiness. Be an action-taking machine. It's not the decisions you make, it's the actions you take. How many people here was like, oh, I've made a decision. I'm going to start that business. Oh, that's amazing. And then three months later, how's that business going? Oh, I'm just getting prepared. I'm just doing, you know, yeah, no, I haven't got to it yet. Just got to start my LLC. I'm like, do you know how long it takes to start an LLC? About 10 minutes online. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the decisions that you make, it's the actions you take. And I remind myself of this all the time. I make a decision, I'm like, well, the only thing that matters is, am I moving forward in that decision? Have I actioned it? And I keep saying this in my mind all the time, and that gets me out of procrastination and into forward movement. Be unreasonable in your requests. Become an ask hole. <laughs> so I was talking about this scientific study. We, we've got to get 140 people in the next nine days into this thing. We're at 85, so we need, what's my math? I need another 55 people. Right? In order for us to get those remaining 55 people, I've got to ask. Oh, thank you, 87. So less. Thank you, Claire. Oh, awesome. Uh, I've got to ask a lot of people. 
I gotta call a lot of people, I gotta ask for their help. Can you promote this? Will you help? Have you got any ideas? And the only thing that's, well, I've been stopped from asking a lot of people recently because I'm thinking, ah, oh, they're gonna think that the only time that I reach out to them is when I want something. And candidly, for some of them it is, because I haven't nurtured that friendship. And so I've got this resistance, like, oh, I've got to reach out and ask this guy for help, but I haven't really paid attention to whatever's going on in his world the last two years, and I feel really awkward. And then I'm creating all these reasons in my mind as to why I shouldn't make the request. And then I come back to be unreasonable, remove reasons, and just take the action anyway, because I don't know what he's thinking. Maybe he's going, oh, my God, it's so great to hear from James. I'd love to help him. But I'm sitting there doing nothing because I'm like, he doesn't want to hear from me. I'm sitting there going, oh, he's going to think I'm, I'm a taker. So remove your reasons and just take action and become an ask whole. Change your language, change your life. Be intentional with your words. How many of us, I tell you, I hear this on P90 calls all the time. Oh, I need to stop. I have to do better at this. I need to do this. And we're creating the story around the words and the meaning, right? It's like this heavy, dark thing. We're judging ourselves. But if we change the language to, I want to do this, I get to do this, I choose to do this, completely different meaning. Completely different meaning. Just like Juliana was talking earlier today, it's like we're choosing how to feel. We're choosing these emotions after those first 90 seconds, right? So we get to choose our language. So let's use empowering verbiage as opposed to verbiage which keeps us in being stuck and guilt and shame and judgment. Anyone seen Empire Strikes Back? Mm -hmm. You know the scene where Luke Skywalker is going to try to, with his mind, bring the spaceship out of the swamp? He's like, all right, I'll give it a try. And Yoda says, no, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. That was a great impression, I think. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> It was Yoda with an Australian accent, yeah. <laughs> with a twang of American from 20 years in the US as well, yeah. I mean, how many people say, yeah, I'll try, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. Well, okay. A lot of times what's really served me is saying, I'm not going to try to get 140 people in this scientific study. We're just going to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it. Seems pretty overwhelming, but we're just going to do it. And we're going to keep going until the way is revealed. A lot of us, myself included, when we first set out, it's like, this is how we're going to do it. And then I had to remind myself, actually, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're just going to take great actions every single day consistently, and we'll get there. And we're not going to try, we're just going to do. So there is no try, do or do not. Here's the last one. This is going to seem a little jarring to some people, but I choose to see life through the lens of life is empty and meaningless. What that means is we're starting from a slate of none of this means anything and life is just empty. And everything that we experience in life is our own perception and our own choice and our own feelings. We are all meaning-making machines. We're make, making things mean this is good, we're making mean things this is bad, we're making what she said to be awful, we're making what... She said to be amazing. But all they really did was that they said something. And the only thing that's going on in life is that there's a bunch of stuff happening. And that's it. But because we're meaning-making machines, we're saying, oh, that's good. Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's wrong. Oh, that's right. So I just invite you, look at life through the lens of it's starting with empty, and it's all meaningless. And from there, we get to create our own meaning. We're going we're gonna to create the meaning because we're meaning-making machines. But we're starting from a position of life is empty and meaningless. All right, that's the 21 ways to the good life, to my good life. Hi, this is James Swanick, and we're taking applications for our 90-day and one-year stop drinking programs. Clients are mostly executives, entrepreneurs, and investors who have tried unsuccessfully and repeatedly to stop drinking but remain stuck in a frustrating cycle of stop start, stop start. Our programs are not AA, which has a reported 7% success rate. Our programs are not rehab, which has a reported 6% success rate. 
Our 90 day and one year programs involve a safe, fun, virtual community of high achievers with a process that boasts an incredible 92% success rate of clients reaching at least 90 consecutive days alcohol free. We use the latest neuroscience and personal development processes to help rewire clients' brains around alcohol and minimize its importance in their lives. We will show you how to powerfully socialize with friends, family, and colleagues, what to say and how to say it so people don't mistakenly think that you're an alcoholic or have a problem, and how to eliminate the temptation of returning to constant drinking so you can finally break the stop-start cycle. To ensure client success, Project 90 can only accept 15 new clients each month. Some of those happy clients include John Keltner from California who said, I've lost 10 pounds. Susie Vaughn, a real estate broker in Tennessee who said, I've generated 20% more leads. Jessica Gaines Jarbo from Kentucky who says, I've now got joy, focus, presence, and clarity. And Joe Worley from Michigan who says, my wife has the real Joe back. If you're an executive entrepreneur or investor who's sick of the stop-start cycle and the damaging effects alcohol has on your health, happiness, and family, and you're ready to regain confidence, become more present with your spouse and children, reduce stress, anxiety, and irritability, sleep better, increase focus and productivity, and feel better quickly, you're invited to apply to become a Project 90 client. Applicants can apply for an introductory interview by visiting alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project90. There's a link in the show notes, which you can just click, but that link is alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash project90.